Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, a major Republican candidate drops out of the race for president, narrowing the field ahead of the next debate. Utah's governor faces his first challenger of 2024. And as ballots begin to hit mailboxes, new polling reveals which way voters are leaning on major issues. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Ben Winslow, reporter with Fox 13 News, Sage Miller, political reporter with KUER, and Brian King, Democratic member of the Utah House of Representatives from Salt Lake City. So glad to have you all with us because we're going to talk about some very interesting issues, key races, key issues that Utahns are watching closely. But can we talk about the governor's race first? Ben, let's start with you. And so, so it begins. Already, can you believe this? <laughs> the, the 2024 race for the governor, uh, we're going to start talking about a lot, particularly because we have a new entrant. Right. Phil Lyman, jumping Phil in. Lyman. Representative Lyman, who... Uh, currently representing southeastern Utah in the legislature, former San Juan County Commissioner, most famously arrested for his part in a protest of federal lands policies. And he released a pretty bombastic campaign video, too, just touching on a lot of big red meat issues uh, to certainly rile up a certain base of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. So, Sage, it's an interesting strategy because I guess we know where he will be campaigning. Yes, yeah, he's definitely going for the more conservative vote that was probably most likely unhappy with the current governor. And he also took some interesting tactics in that bombastic campaign video. Specifically, he had his mugshot front and center. Mm -hmm. It was like one of the, the third or fourth photos that was shown about how this was like him, him being arrested for this protest on public lands um, was a way to stand up to the government. It was a way to push back against what he called the, the liberal agenda and the radical liberal agenda. And so he's really very much so catering to this populace that is very much so unhappy with the way that current politics is, I guess, rolling out mm -hmm. specifically on more social issues. He focused a lot on kind of transgender issues as well, like not allowing uh, uh, not allowing transgender girls into boys' bathrooms and vice versa. Um, so the bathroom debate. Um, and he also very much so kind of capitalized on something that uh, former President Donald Trump did of hoping that this kind of mugshot, this idea of being arrested in the hands of the law, standing up for what you believe in is a catapult to actually gaining support. So he is kind of taking a more interesting approach that I don't think that we've seen outside of President Donald Trump. And uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll definitely see how it goes. <laughs> So, Representative, how does this play with those rural voters? Because in instead of that arrest being something he would not talk about, it is front and center in terms of the campaign. Yeah, Phil is a Phil and I served together in the House, and uh, he's taking this line of being a contrarian, of standing up to authority, of uh, anti-government sort of an approach. And he's also an election denier. He's squarely in the MAGA camp, and he is. Uh, much more, we're seeing much more from Phil, what I see from a lot of new, the, especially the newer members of the House and the Senate in this legislature, which is they're more conservative, they're more uh, in, the tr in the camp of Donald Trump and wanting to promote those kinds of things. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays. Uh, it's interesting to me also that Spencer Cox is a rural Utah. He doesn't think of himself as a MAGA candidate, but he nevertheless uh, comes from that kind of same, the same kind of roots that Phil Lyman comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, Sage, we've done some polling uh, recently to see how uh, Governor Cox is doing, and uh, this was from June, so we just follow this every every couple of months. He was at 63 percent approval in the state and 66 percent approval among the Republican Party. That's so, those are some pretty good numbers. Yeah, so it's going to be hard to beat somebody that has a good approval rating among the constituents that already exist. And I also think that Phil Lyman is going for, you know, somebody who's kind of sick of the status quo, who kind of wants to play a little bit of hardball, who wants to shake it up a little bit. And I don't know how much of an appetite exists in the state of Utah for that. Um, um, they, if they're happy with the governor, I don't know why they would want to shake, shake up the status quo, why they would want somebody in a different kind of, want somebody else in that authority position leading the state. He seems very likable uh, to a lot of just his party, say maybe besides the convention folks. Um, they aren't very pleased with him, but not the majority of voters who are Republican are not that convention face. So they are moderate. And so I think that if Phil Lyman wants to genuinely 
win the the like the popular vote for governor, he's going to have to appeal to the moderates. And I don't know if that campaign video is doing the job. Uh, let's talk about what might happen there. Keep in mind, in 2020, for that race, uh, there were eight Republicans. So, Ben, talk about what happens going forward and some names that you're hearing of people who may be on the Republican side interested in jumping in. Well, certainly we know of at least one other that is likely to jump in, and that's Carson Jorgensen, the former uh, Republican Party chair. Uh, he could still jump into this race. And I do wonder if, with Representative Lyman and with Mr. Jorgensen, if that doesn't split that sort of crowd that, uh, that that appeals to. Governor Cox remains very popular. I don't know if you're going to see as many Republicans get into the race this go-round because he is the incumbent. He is it just really, he enjoys that level of popularity. He probably will gather signatures. I would expect he would. And that uh, that earns him a spot on the primary. And, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, how, how does that question play out with both parties, uh, with the Republicans and the Democrats? I'm, I'm curious, Representative, the signature gathering question, it seems like most people are doing it now without a whole lot of negative consequences from their caucus convention representatives. Right, right. I think that that's much more common among the Republicans because you see Republicans having inter-party challenges a, much, a lot more frequently than you see with Democrats. But it used to be that there were some who would say, I'm never going to support anyone who gathers signatures. This was their way of pushing back on the alternate route to the ballot of signature gathering. And as you said, I think that that has fizzled. And you haven't seen a lot of backlash for candidates who choose to go and gather signatures. I can't believe that uh, Spencer Cox would not be out there gathering signatures. He's not going to risk a, a chance to be the nominee for his party for a second term uh, by going through a convention. He's going to gather signatures, mm -hmm. I'm confident. Before we leave that entirely, Sage, uh, do, do you agree with this idea that, that we, we may have fewer candidates on the Republican side this year because you have an incumbent that has some popularity? Is that what you're hearing? Yeah, I definitely think that it's going to be a smaller pool of Republicans. What's going to interest me the most, though, is which Republican wins that convention. Because as Ben said, if you have the split between allegedly Carson Jorgensen eventually hopping into the race and you have Phil Lyman, which most likely are going for the same constituents, they have very similar platforms and beliefs when it comes to like what the state of Utah should look like. Um, I'd be very curious to see how how delegates split that vote yeah. and who they delegates want to be their nominee between two very similar candidates. Mm -hmm. The plurality issue definitely was at play in that last election. And so, Representative, we have to talk about the Democrats for a minute, too. In that 2020 race, there were six. I think people <laughs> so, are looking uh, at you. you are, you're all looking at me in a way that Is there something you want to share? makes me uncomfortable. You know? <laughs> well, so we're, we're talking about the Democrats and who they may put up this, this cycle for uh, the governor's race. And, of course, uh, the news is saying that you, you may be one of them. I, don't, I know you were, stuff's coming, but thoughts? No, no, no. I, I'm, looking, I'm looking at it. And this is why. I, it, look, <laughs> one of the things I think is really true for people is that they feel like they haven't left their party, but their party has left them. We've seen some real shifts in the last 5, 10, 15 years in what the parties stand for and how people who have traditionally been Democrats or Republicans their whole lives are saying, I feel like I've uh, adrift. I, I don't feel my party represents me. I think we deserve better representation in this state of Utah than to have supermajority candidates elected over and over and over again, both at the legislature and in the governor's office. It's been decades since we've seen statewide, a statewide individual who is a Democrat hold that seat. I just think that Utahns are going to be best served by having a different perspective. And look, I, I haven't made a decision on this. It's a hard decision to make, quite honestly. It involves family and work and legislative issues of my own. I'm going through that process. But I'll tell you what I feel strongly about is Utahns need to have the very best candidates that they can and individuals holding these critical offices. And I want to get out there and uh, provide a vision and an, an alternative and a list of priorities that I think is going to resonate with Utahns. And we're working through the process, and I hope to know sooner rather than later where I end up. Mm -hmm. But what lets you think that you can appeal to Republican voters in a Republican state and potentially be a Democratic you know, governor? He's supposed to be <laughs> asking Always the, the reporter, questions I see, here, yeah. Ben. Um, well, look, I, I think people are tired of party labels, quite honestly, Ben. I think that people are looking for individuals as candidates who can speak to their values and priorities in a way that transcends party labels. And look, I, I've worked up at the legislature now for 15 years. I've tried to be the tip of the spear on important issues that Democrats felt strongly about, while at the same time reaching across the aisle to work with Republicans to get legislation passed. 
and I've had some success in both those things. So threading the needle on that of standing up and uh, representing democratic values well while at the same time working well with Republicans is something that is a challenge, but I think I've done that well and would, if I did throw my hat into the race, I think that would be a strength. Hmm. Can we talk about another race? Our Senate race. We have another candidate that has just filed this week, Carolyn Fippen, former staffer to Senator Lee. She's run for office once before in the state of Utah against Representative Jeff Stenquist. Uh, this brings the total to six, Ben. That's right. Six candidates. We are getting a lot of people jumping into this race. I wonder if by the end of this, we just, if not, have upwards of a dozen, really. When you have an open seat like this, everybody is thinking about if they could be the senator. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely some candidates who have the leg up. I mean, you think about House Speaker Brad Wilson. He's raised a lot of money in a little bit of time. And, you know, you just wonder how much money there is available. And does that suck up a lot of the resources? So there's just not a lot to go around for you to get out there. But, you know, this could be an interesting election cycle. And you can't rule anything out. Surprises happen all the time. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes it kind of interesting in the money aspect is first, Brad Wilson donated a lot to his own campaign, mm -hmm. so he essentially took out a loan. And then second, Celeste Malloy did not raise a lot of money and still overwhelmingly won the primary election and is, 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 is still not raising a ton of money for the CD2 election. But, you know, at this point, I don't know if it if that matters that much. It may, may matter more for a Senate race. This is the first Senate race that I'm covering as a politics reporter in Utah, so it'd be kind of interesting to see how those dynamics play. But I do feel like Celeste Malloy is an interesting case study of kind of defying the narrative of how much money you need to raise in order to get in front of voters. And uh, it may be different that we have a, like a good handful of Republicans vying for the same position, but I, I don't think that the, the, the title speaker really holds that much weight. So for a lot of for a lot of Utahns, so I think it's going to come down, yeah, to campaign strategy and maybe a little bit of money, but mostly like who's going to get out in front of voters? Yeah. Who's going to resonate the best? Yeah, so, Representative, you, you've had to run some, some elections for a while now, and you do. You need money, you need name ID, and uh, Brad, Brad Wilson certainly seems to be hitting a couple of those categories, but these other candidates, let's talk about them for just a moment. And do you see anyone else getting in, or have, has the field been frozen a bit? Well, I, I, I'll be interested to see who gets in between now and the end of the year. Of course, we have to declare the first week of January, so we're going to know by the end of the year who's going to be in and who's not, at least credible candidates who are going to be in. It's interesting, I've worked with uh, Speaker Wilson for many years now. Uh, I was the minority leader most of the time that he was the speaker. And he, when you're in the legislature, you get the impression that everybody knows what you're doing and is following you, and you think that because you're in a leadership position that people know who you are and you have name recognition. I'm not so sure that's true. I think that, uh, you know, the name recognition is higher than for a lot of other Republicans, but I think there are a lot of Republicans who can make a, their way in the field against Brad Wilson. And it remains to be seen whether he's a shoe in I'd like to uh, see some good discussion among a variety of different Republican candidates. Uh, we've had individuals who ran for governor in 2020 uh, that I think would be great candidates to hop in this race. Uh, so it'll, it'll be, I'm intrigued to see who's going to jump in. Do you have a comment, Ben? I just think, yeah, stay tuned. Um, it depends on how many people get in, how big the names are. And there is, as Sage said, you know, you got to get in front of voters. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some presidential candidates that are trying to get in front of voters and some maybe who haven't done so well. Sage, a big exit uh, this past week. Uh, Mike Pence, the former vice president, announced that he is withdrawing from the race as president. You got to give credit where credit's due of when you know when to quit. Um, and so this was probably a good chance for him. He wasn't polling very well. He wasn't performing very well in these debates. And I think he was walking this line of, I was the vice president to a very controversial figure in American politics. Um, and that controversial figure is not too happy with me right now, so I'm probably not going to garner that base. So what actually is my base? And do I have the ability to essentially take those voters from other other kind of moderate or conservative Republicans on the stage? And I don't think that I don't think I don't think he had it. I think he had too much opposition against him. And there's other people that perhaps are more palatable to to a to a Republican, another Republican nominee that's not Donald well, Trump. I mean, look, let's be honest, January 6th is the big uh, uh, factor in Mike Pence's demise, quite honestly. I think that it was very, very hard for him to appeal to base Republican voters while at the same time drawing so much criticism from Donald Trump for basically not facilitating Donald Trump's continuing 
uh, service as President of the United States. And, and that's hard for him to get past when the leader of the party, when the guy who by far has more support than any other Republican, is shooting arrows at you. And, and I think that made it hard for him. I, it doesn't help Mike Pence that he's pretty stiff and uh, is seen as humorless, uh, uh, but, but I wasn't surprised to see him drop out of the race. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about what's happening. We'll get to the numbers on how they're polling in Utah in a moment. But Ben, there has been a little bit of a narrative kind of growing in the Republican Party, and Pence alluded to it a little bit about narrowing this field, because the more people stay in, the more likely one candidate is going to stand out. And is this a little sign of what we might see come? Will more people do, as Sage has talked about, and see sort of the writing on the wall, or, or just will they stay in? It's going to be interesting to watch what happens because I think this is the start of people just dropping out. They're just, they're not going to have the fundraising momentum. They're not going to have the polling momentum. They're just not going to resonate with voters, you know, in these critical battleground states where you have to, you know, kind of sink or swim. And this is sort of the natural progression. That being said, this is Trump being far and away ahead of everybody else. And it, it seems like everybody's in this race, and whatever's happening with his criminal cases, whatever's happening with the civil cases against him, it's not landing, at least in polling, what we've seen thus far. Uh, but we got to also see what happens in some of these battleground states as they start having their primaries, you know, who, who they're supporting. Uh, I'm even curious to see what happens with our preference poll next right, year to right. see how Utahns feel yeah. about Trump. Yeah, Sage, I want to ask you about, uh, do you have a comment first? No, yeah, I definitely think that in this case, because Utah doesn't cuddle up to Trump as much as other red states, predominantly red states do, this primary is going to be very interesting for Utah, almost where I think Utah may be a battleground state, because there are kind of like wavering ideas of who we would want to be the presidential primary. Trump may be leading right now, but other candidates are gaining ground in Utah, because again, we just didn't have the palette, or the Utah electorate did not have the palette for Donald Trump as much as other Republican candidates in past years. So I don't know. I think it'll be very interesting to see where Utah goes. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about these numbers for a second, Representative, because we even have a student question, but let me give you these numbers first. This is a brand new poll, Deseret News, the Hinckley Institute of Politics. This is Utahns overall uh, on the presidential candidates. Donald Trump was at 24 percent, Ron DeSantis at 11, I'm just giving you the highest ones, and 12 percent for Mike Pence. What's interesting here is Nikki Haley is starting to inch up across the country, but in Utah too. So here's the student question for you to respond to. Hi, my name is Max Laporte, and I'm a junior at the University of Utah studying political science. My question today has to do with the upcoming 2024 Republican presidential primaries. Recently, it appears that former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley has been gaining some traction in Utah. I was just wondering, what exactly is it about former Governor Haley that makes her a candidate that Utahns like, as opposed to some of the other Republican presidential primary candidates? I guess you're going to put on your Republican hat here for a second. Well, one of the, the, those numbers that you read are interesting, but I think one of the most interesting numbers is that uh, you have Trump at much lower approval levels in Utah than a lot of other states, most other states, and where he's running in the Republican primary. And that leaves an opening for people like Nikki Haley. The, the question was, what's attractive about Nikki Haley? I think there are several things. One is she's got great foreign policy experience as well as experience as a state governor. She was governor of South Carolina for many years. So, you know, you've got someone who has diversity of experience, and you've got someone who reflects both gender diversity and racial diversity within the Republican party. I think Utahns like that much more than most Republicans in other states, actually. Mm -hmm. But can we talk about who's polling second in this? Don't know. Yes. That's Th stunning. That number's at 28 percent. Right. So Trump is, what, 30 percent? Mm -hmm. He's at 24. Sorry. 24 percent, DeSantis 11, Nikki Haley 12. Another candidate so was So really, 15. the leader don't of the know. poll is don't know. It is. Wow. Sounds like there might be some... That's what I'm saying. It could be a battleground state. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. It's very much so up in the air. But on Nikki Haley, I think there's a few things that make her unique outside of kind of just her demographics. I think, first, she is a very pragmatic person. And I think people are, especially in Utah, are kind of sick of just a lot of the drama. And she doesn't seem very drama loaded. Second, she calls out her party. She does it exactly on the debate stage of, like, we've, if we want to tackle fiscal spending and overspending, we kind of have to look in the mirror, Republicans, and recognize that we are also contributing to the problem. And perhaps we shouldn't. We should be fighting back harder. And then 
And third, I think specifically with women voters in Utah, is her stance on abortion. She's not for abortion by any means, but she's also saying we shouldn't make a federal law that says we should ban abortion or restrict abortion. The goal was to give it to the states, let the states do it. However, if you restrict it to the point of, you know, where mortality rates and, 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 and mortality rates are increasing, that's going to backfire on the party. So perhaps we should just separate the two, not make a federal law when it comes to abortion, and just let the states do their thing and let the courts fight it out. But we've done our job. We've overturned Roe v. Wade at the Supreme Court level, and therefore we can move on and look at other things about how we can support mm -hmm. women, children, and families. And I think that resonates. I think with uh, conservative-leaning and Republican uh, Utahns that I've spoken with, they have certainly walked away from the debates impressed with her, impressed with her stances and how she has engaged with other candidates. So I can see it, it makes sense that she would be rising in polls here. Mm -hmm. Here's uh, the, here's the yeah. problem, Jason, for any Republican running for president these days, and that is everybody knows Donald Trump will not go away quietly. You can have a primary process that shows Nikki Haley in March or April or May edging out in front of Donald Trump. There's no way he will walk away and say, okay, the people have spoken. I'll uh, walk off into the sunset. He didn't do that in 2020 with the presidency. He's not going to do it in 2024 with the Republican nomination. Every Republican knows that. And how does it affect their feelings about what they do? Would they rather have the party blow up because Donald Trump throws a tantrum on the way out and burns the house down? Or would they rather uh, just suck it up and go with him? I want to switch gears just a little bit to see what the implications are in the, the House of Representatives, uh, the approaches our candidates are taking. I just want just a moment because there's a small window for, the, for Utah in this House uh, Speaker race. What's so interesting, Ben, is uh, we, we polled Utahns about what they thought about Kevin McCarthy being ousted as the House Speaker. What's interesting is 34 percent of Utahns approved, 39 percent disapproved. We know what happened uh, through all of that. But what's interesting here is there might be a place for Representative Blake Moore from right. all the shuffle that happens. He has thrown his hat into the ring to be the vice chair of the Republican conference. That's right. And the conference is going to vote how the conference wants to vote. I want to see also who else names we're seeing floated as far as for that position and, you know, see where the conference lands. But it is a potential for him to slide into a pretty mm -hmm. significant role in the House. Yeah. A lot of shuffling there. Which would be pretty big for Utah because mm -hmm. a bunch of, you know, academic articles show that when you have somebody from your state in higher leadership positions, you're more likely to get y your name out there. The state's more likely to get money. You're more likely to pass legislation. And so it would be big for Utah to have kind of a leader, specifically kind of a, a junior, a, a junior lawmaker, yeah. a junior congressman being in that kind of state. We also did see a fairly young uh, lawmaker make it to become the Speaker of the House. So there could be an upward trajectory of maybe perhaps we should have a little less seasoned people in these higher leadership positions mm -hmm. because they appeal to a different base. But I do know that Blake Moore is also on some pretty pretty sought after committees as well within the legislature. So he seems to have a pretty good name for himself and um, trying to make those relationships. I've talked to him a few times where he says that he has pretty good relationships with Kevin McCarthy, with Jim Jordan, with Steve Scalise. So he already has kind of that name recognition amongst the, the leaders of the party. And so it's a question of where where he can take that and um, how much sleep he's willing to get at night because that job's going to be yeah. really hard. It will indeed. Uh, while we're talking about the House representative, uh, we have a congressional race. Right now we're operating with three representatives in D.C. We're waiting for that fourth. Talk about that second congressional district. Well, we've got uh, Celeste Malloy uh, going up against Kathleen Reby. Kathleen is a Democratic state senator. She's a remarkable woman, a teacher. Uh, I'm proud to know her and support her, uh, and, and the polling shows that she's within striking distance. So, Yeah, so it's interesting uh, how this is, is, is shaping up this particular race with these two candidates that, despite all the odds, have, have, have not just put together a lot of uh, support, but some pretty good funding. It's sort of an open seat, and so you do have that phenomenon where it's anybody's game at this point. The thing that I want to know is, what are you going to do about Southern Utah? Southern Utah appears yes. to be the power center. St. George, yeah. this election cycle, seems to have shown, and rural Utah has flexed its muscle much more than urban Utah. Yeah. And with the makeups of the districts, Washington County appears to be the new power center. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Sage, because that's what the candidates are talking about. Some of these candidates are spending a lot of time in the southern part of the state. Because representation matters, and that was 
very much so highlighted in the primary election of Becky Edwards, very much so kind of hoped that the urban vote would pull her through, whereas Celeste Malloy put a lot of her weight on the smaller counties within the district, and it paid off. So, yeah, you do have to focus all of your attention there. There's a good chance the majority of the urban voters are going to go for Kathleen Reedy. So where does that mean for the rest of the big population of rural Utah? And that's kind of up in the air. We know that they very much so liked uh, Celeste Malloy in the primary. So that's where I think uh, Senator Reby needs to put a lot of her weight on, is what does Southern Utah think? What can she do to help them? And I also think a disadvantage that Reby has is that she doesn't live in the district, and Malloy does. And so Malloy has this talking point of being able to say, I live here, I've seen the issues, I grew up here. And that's something that Kathleen Reby doesn't have. I don't know if that have. means much, though, because we've had so many congressional representatives who don't live in the district they represent, and it's bi bipartisan. We've had yeah. Democrats and Republicans who don't do that. Well, I don't know, know how much that has, means for voters. And the way the state has been gerrymandered, uh, everybody represents significant rural poor Portions, as well as significant urban portions, regardless of what congressional district you're talking about. But I will say, I think representation matters with specifically within this race. It was a big conversation at convention. It's been a big conversation on the campaign trail. Like, Governor Cox has talked about how he would love to have somebody in Congress from Southern Utah. So there has been a lot of discussion and kind of amping up having somebody outside of the Wasatch Front in Washington. So and I think that matters. It's going to have to be the last word. So insightful. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.